Welcome to CN Live. This is Joe Loria, and we have a very special guest today. His name is George Hurst, and he is the former editor of a newspaper called The Magnetic Times. It was published on Magnetic Island, which is off Townsville in Queensland. George, welcome to CN Live today. Hi, Joe. How are you? I'm fine. And we're here to talk to George about maybe the most famous resident of Magnetic Island. I don't know. You could tell me if he isn't. Maybe there are others. Uh, and that would be none other than Julian Assange, who was born 53 years ago in Townsville, which is just right across from Magnetic Island. And George is here to talk to us about the island and about Julian Assange's life growing up there and how he's remembered today, now that he's back in Australia. So, George, tell us, first of all, Magnetic Island. Why is it called Magnetic Island? Magnetic Island is about five miles offshore from... Queensland, which is a big Australian state, uh, Queensland's second largest city, known as Townsville. And Magnetic Island is within the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area, and it has coral and lovely fish, and it's a very beautiful place. It's also somewhere where people actually live, and so we can commute from Townsville to the island many times a day. I went there once and um, you can take a helicopter as well. <laughs> that was you, exciting. You were, you were very posh taking a helicopter, but to Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> to Maggie, I know. <laughs> Maggie Island. Horseshoe Bay, oh, some beautiful beaches there. Really incredible, lovely, you know, family holiday. Oh, yeah. I, oh, I loved it. It was like paradise, except for that crocodile that almost got to eat me. You don't talk about that. Right, there's a regular ferry. Uh, it's it's very civilised, really. It's very nice and very pretty, and uh, a lot of people love to live here. Uh, there's about 2,300 residents, and the island was named by Captain James Cook, who was sailing past back in 1770, and he had some problems with his compass, and it seemed to be going strange from where he was, which was about uh, maybe five or six miles out to sea. And he could see this, what appeared to be an island, which was very rocky. It's noted for its massive granite tours and uh, it's uh, a real feature. And he thought maybe it's the rocks that had some magnetic effect on his compass. So he named the island Magnetical Isle and then later it was realised it was an island and and so on, and it became Magnetic Island. But the proper name really is Yanbanan, which is the name given to Magnetic Island by the Wulgarukaba people, who are the traditional owners of Magnetic Island. And uh, that's, that's important to know as well. Do any of them still live on the island, indigenous people? Yes. Um, there is a couple of families, and they have a pretty interesting story to tell as well. The island has a really interesting history, actually, and it's, on, it's one of my favourite subjects, but without going into great depth... Go um, ahead. Go ahead. We love depth. You like depth. Program. Okay, yeah. well, look, in the 1860s, Townsville was first established. It was the frontier. That's in the, the frontier wars where Aboriginal Australians were basically hunted down and eliminated or rounded up and sent to missions and various places where they suffered a lot of trouble. On Magnetic Island, strangely, the place wasn't of much use to anybody except for there was a the first white settler, a guy by the name of Harry Butler, came over and thought it would be a good place to have a little farm and maybe people could come for holidays and so on. And he formed a very good, positive relationship with the Wulgarukava people. And from all accounts, things on the island were actually quite different to the way they were on the mainland. And there's a nice sort of interaction going on. It was very peaceful until the government comes in at about uh, between 1900 and 1920. And then they basically ruled that all of the Aboriginal people of Magnetic Island were to be taken off and sent to a place called Palm Island, which is, we can see it from Magnetic Island, it's further up in the reef. Palm Island became a kind of central repository for all the different tribes of North Queensland, and they were just brought and dumped in this place with 
very heavy security um, overseeing and their lives were hugely controlled. It was an ugly place. And it wasn't until the 1990s that the Johnson family first returned to Magnetic Island and they were able to prove their ancestry and connections to the island. And we're pretty happy to have them back and uh, they're really terrific people. And so that, that's been a nice thing in the time that I've lived here on the island, which is about 34 years, that uh, the Wulgarukaba have to some extent returned to the island and their culture is much more respected these days than it used to be. So is it true about the, the rocks disturbing the compass? Was, is, is that just... Yeah. It, is? Um, it was never found to happen again. Ah. And nobody really knows what happened to Cook's compass. Um, but, yeah, it's just one of those funny mm -hmm. anomalies that um, ended up giving, well, for, for an English name, it's a pretty cool name. It's, a lot of people are very fond of the place being called Magnetic Island, and uh, it is actually very magnetic for a lot of people. It's a very attractive place. Right. We were recently in Whitby in the east coast of England where Cook <coughs> set off from, and apparently his compass worked from there anyway. So uh, let's talk about the island. In 1970, Assange was born in Townsville. Yeah. Uh, sometime after that, he moved to Mananic Island. Uh, apparently, there were only 500 people living on the island at that time. Is that right? Look, I'm not the best person to ask about the population just then. That sounds about right. Julian was born in Townsville Hospital in 1971, I believe, and his mum, Christine, brought him immediately to the island to live in a house she found to rent. And, in fact, that house is in my street. It's just down the road, and I drive past it or ride my bike past it every day. That's one of the, the houses. It doesn't look much like what it would have been then. It was a much more simple the island in those days was kind of a lot of shacks. There were a lot of beach shacks where people would put up a sort of a weekender, they'd call them, um, a very simple structured house that they could come over and spend a few nights and go fishing or go swimming and then they'd go back to Townsville or wherever. So a lot of the homes on the island weren't very substantial. But about that time we actually had a huge cyclone that, absolutely blew most of the place away. And so since then, they've built stronger houses and it's been a, a different experience. But during the 70s, um, it's an interesting time on Magnetic Island. It's before my time, but I have studied that period to some extent. And you find that it's also the time when hippies are showing up in the Australian culture and they're moving in all sorts of places and they come to Magnetic Island in some numbers. And it's an interesting time because you've got this very traditional conservative Queensland uh, establishment of, um, it's quite like the Deep South, or it was anyway. But at that time in the 70s, you've got a town that relied basically on being a railway head and a military base and an abattoir. So they're not the most you know, intellectually stimulating attributes to a city. But at that time, they began to establish a university. So all of a sudden, there's university-type people were coming into the city. And, of course, because the island was so close, some of them would go and live on the island or visit or there'd be quite a bit of back and forth. But a kind of counterculture movement happened to a small extent, but significantly on the island where people were just coming and living on the dole and... Um, having a really terrific time and uh, and just thoroughly enjoying the beauty of the place. And, and it really is a spectacularly beautiful place. But I should mention in framing that, Christine Assange, who came and actually stayed with us some years ago, and we got to know her pretty well, she claims quite adamantly that she was not a hippie. She didn't describe to that kind of thing. She said, I didn't smoke dope, I didn't do that stuff. She was a person who loved nature. She is a very accomplished artist and she was doing a lot of drawing. Uh, she worked in various jobs on the island at what we call rental moaks or a, a little moke, which is an old fashioned mini car made in Britain that were very popular here years ago. They were hired as a little island car to get around in. 
she worked there, she would slash blocks with a big cane knife to remove um, what's called guinea grass, which is a very, very rampant uh, two to three metre high grass that grows on the island, that sort of thing. But the, the time is a pretty interesting time because you've got a fairly reactionary old school um, of people who were pretty antagonistic to the so-called hippie crowd. And then you've got a range of people who just don't really fit into any category. But, you know, some of them are very highly educated and some of them have a lot of cultural kind of uh, pace in their own right. And uh, so it, it was an interesting mix. So Julian Assange told the New Yorker magazine back in 2010 when they did a big profile of him, he said, quote, most of this period of my childhood was pretty Tom Sawyer. I had my own horse. He had his own horse. I built my own raft. I went fishing. I was going down mine shafts and tunnels. Now, he said something really interesting uh, in an article that he wrote for The Australian, the right-wing Muradoc newspaper, The Australian. He cited... Queenslanders' willingness to, quote, speak their minds bluntly as influencing his desire to create WikiLeaks, whose motto is we open governments. I'm reading now from a Sydney Morning Herald piece, by the way, in, in 2010 as well, which quotes the New Yorker magazine. So he quotes, uh, and I want to get your reaction to this. I grew up in a Queensland country town where people spoke their minds bluntly. They distrusted big government as something that could be corrupted if not watched carefully. The dark days of corruption in the Queensland government before the Fitzgerald inquiry are testimony to what happens when the politicians gag the media from reporting the truth. And it says he wrote that in the hours before his arrest. That was his first arrest from the Swedish case. Then he said, quote, these things have stayed with me. WikiLeaks was created around these core values. The idea conceived in Australia was to use Internet technologies in new ways to report the truth. Is that the Queensland that you know, or at least the one from the 1970s? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I think that Queenslanders are pretty direct. And I should say that I'm not originally a Queenslander myself. I, I came from the South. I moved up here a long time ago. But they're people who don't mince words. They... Um, they're, yeah, they are direct, but they're, they're very friendly people too. Um, they're very warm people. Um, I think just more particularly on the island, I've noticed, I think there's a lot more uh, strong and assertive women here too, which is quite a feature. You, you know, I was at a party last night and I was talking to any number of people and a number of women who really you find have a very sharp mind and capability to express themselves. And it just feels... That's how it is, at least on the island. But Queenslanders, they don't mince words. They're direct and they're country people in a lot of ways and uh, they're probably less interested in the sophisticated sort of terms that other people might use. They, they get straight to the point, I think, and, you know, we've certainly seen that on the island. Well, I've been around this country, though, never to Queensland, and I... Uh... I find Australians in general pretty blunt, uh, so that they must be extremely blunt up there. Um, uh, she says, um, Christine wrote this, that I, my name is Assange. I lived on the island three times in 71. Uh, and she rented an island cottage for $12 per week in Picnic Bay. She lived in a bikini going native with my baby and other mums on the island back in 76 uh, with a new husband. She lived in Horseshoe Bay in an old abandoned pineapple farm. She slashed her way to the front door with a machete, she says, shot a tapon, which I understand <laughs> is a snake, right, in the yeah. water tank and on her son's bed, on Julian's bed, there was a snake. Had to suspend fruit from ceiling to protect from the possums. Back in 82, she lived with another little child lived in a flat on Esplanade in uh, Picnic Bay. So uh, she's still in love with the island. Uh, what He didn't go to school, apparently. Uh, she homeschooled him. Is that, is that your yeah, understanding? That's my understanding as well. Um, Christine told me that she homeschooled him. And there's actually a lot of, there's very little recollection by islanders of Julian. It's a long time ago. He was here. He came and went several times. He didn't go to school at the ordinary school. So 
Um, he didn't grow up with a little generation of kids who, you know, he hung out with in that respect. So I suppose he was probably a bit more of a loner than um, a lot of the other kids in the school. Um, and so there was that separation. I think she said also something about, you know, she didn't want him to um, take on the um, conformity that is spread by schools and the adherence to authority and so on, which uh, uh, is part of that, which certainly seems to have been uh, a success in, in Julian's case. So you mentioned one uh, house down the road from where you are, where Julian lived. Yeah. Are, there many, are there many other sites that are associated with his time in, Look, uh, on Magnetic Island? There's a couple. Um, but again, there's really not much you can hang on. The, the house on the corner from, from in our street has been extensively reshaped. And in fact, just this last week, they've done quite a lot more work on the same house and its gardens and so on. I doubt whether Christine would even recognise the house these days, but she knew exactly where it was and, you know, it's still that same place. Then there is... A block of flats, which is also only about two minutes' walk from where I am now, which is on the beach, on the Esplanade. Um, and again, they were done up from the times that she was here, and they're quite plush now. They've been completely refurbished, and, you know, it's prime real estate, so they're in a really great location, and I'm sure they... Uh, they managed to uh, get a pretty penny for leasing them out for holiday makers. But um, when I got here, and I've actually got old photos of that block, they were pretty basic, um, but just in a, in a really good spot. And um, then there's a couple of other, the, the site where she slashed through the um, grass to get to the house, that's a funny one. Um, <clears throat> on the island, that tiny little cottage was known as the Noddy House, maybe because it was so little. I'm not sure. It's, it's just people refer to it from that time as the Noddy House. And it took me quite a long time to work out where that was. And there's no indication of, of that place being there at all anymore because it was moved. And it was basically picked up, put on a truck and moved to the completely the other end of the island to a very isolated part of the island in the bush where it's been used as a sort of bones of another another house by some friends of mine. Um, so it's kind of been taken away, transformed, turned into something else. But I do know where that was and uh, it's the, probably that location hasn't changed all that much except there's a huge drain through the middle of it now. <laughs> so when did you arrive on Magnetic Island? I got here in 91. 91. So yeah. he was long gone to Melbourne by then, right? Is that where they yeah. moved? That's right. So do you, you didn't know them then, obviously, when they lived there, but you do know people who did know them uh, when I, you lived there. Is that right? I know a couple, yeah. yeah. But even their recollections are pretty vague. And, yeah. you know, it's they remember this you know, blonde-headed kid coming through and playing with their kids in the yard and visiting and coming and going and that sort of thing, but not, not really something you could build a strong story out of. Um, yeah. it, it's, it's kind of like that. And I think there's certainly a few other people I've never been able to get to speak more extensively who I think are still kind of, I don't want to go there, you know, we just we'll stick to ourselves. There's a lot of people who just... You know, they're very private and they don't want to kind of talk about stuff um, like, you know, they might think it's a bit controversial and so on. But I do know that there was also another house, well, not a house site, but it was more like a, a shack on the back of a house in Horseshoe Bay, uh, which caught fire. And um, I think Christine and Julian were out at the time and they came back and, and that's remembered by a few people who were in the local fire brigade and, and so on lived up the street. But again, it, it was, yeah, it was a fire, but, uh, you know, some of these things happen from time to time. Um, I should mention, though, that 
the comment about shooting a taipan is probably strongly questioned on the island. A <laughs> taipan is an extremely, it's possibly the most dangerous snake in the world. And there is really very little evidence that there are any taipans on Magnetic Island. Hmm. Uh, what I would say is that it was probably a brown tree snake um, or maybe a whip snake. Um, brown tree snakes could look like a taipan to someone who doesn't know their snakes all that well, but they're harmless. Um, and in fact, it's a it's a terrific place for snakes. We've got we've got some of the nicest snakes around, and there's only one quite dangerous snake, which is a death adder, and um, they're very obliging because you can kind of tread on them all day long, and they finally might wake up and give you a nip, but they're pretty laid back. Um, so you know that's the snake story. Um, it's also you mentioned. Um, Julian was talking about going down mine shafts and things like that. When I talked to Christine, she thought he was mistaken and he'd gotten some of his, he'd mixed up magnetic memories with maybe somewhere else because there really aren't any mine shafts here. Um, he may have found a few caves, but um, no, not really mine shafts. So, you know. It's pretty easy. I think, you know, he, he moved 37 times before he was 16 or something like that. It, was, it must have been pretty confusing for a young guy um, where he was and what he was doing and so on. I don't know about the horse. That's quite possible. Some people had horses that they would, um, in fact, I've got a friend who used to ride his horse to the pub and then he'd managed to hop on the horse and the horse knew the way home and it'd just take him when he oh. was drinking. And... Um, that was a very um, safe way of travel, in fact. The only other thing, too, is he had a little dog called Poss or Possum. And we've seen a couple of photos of Julian with Possum. And that's very cute. And I think he used to, you know, run free around the island with Poss quite a bit. The nice thing about the island even today is that it is still a very safe place. There's very little crime. And you find kids out on the streets by themselves, just doing stuff as we all kind of used to, you know, maybe when we were growing up and there wasn't such a sense of, of threat or security and so on. The island is still kind of that place. and um, They're not at home in front of a screen, in other words. They're out playing like kids used to do. Well, look, computers. there's plenty of kids in front of screens everywhere and still and, and also a magnetic island. But little kids, you will find them running around on the beach in the streets, doing stuff um, that there's just no sense of danger at all towards them. And, uh, yeah. and that, that's one of the really lovely things of, of the island. It still maintained that kind of character. Of course, if uh, Julian didn't spend time in front of screens, he wouldn't be who he is. Now, let me ask you about the attitude of people today. Uh, I'm looking at a poll here in the Townsville Bulletin. <laughs> and, uh, it's from just uh, June 24th, so less than a month ago, and there was a poll because uh, there's a movement, and we did a little film about that uh, when Kathy was up in Townsville some months ago, to build a statue for Julian Assange. Uh, the poll says that 87% of the residents of, there were 1,662 votes, 87% said no, there should not be a statue for Julian Assange, only 13% percent said yes. I doubt there's a blue plaque on any of those uh, houses where he lived. What is uh, the attitude after Julian became world famous and uh, all the controversy surrounding him? Uh, what were the attitudes that you heard uh, on Magnetic Island towards him during his heyday in the 2010, uh, up until now that he's been finally released from prison? Um, look, firstly, about the poll. That was a Townsville Bulletin poll. The Townsville Bulletin is our local Murdoch. Okay. It's a, a terrible paper, and it's usually read by pretty, you know, I won't say terrible people, but um, people who would agree with the, the Townsville Bulletin as, uh, you know, its uh, ethos, its conservatism, its, um, it's just one of those outlying Murdoch hack type of operations. And... A Townsville Bulletin poll means that there are people who are reading the Townsville Bulletin online, and 
I don't think that's in any way a representative survey of how Townsville people would feel. Um, nonetheless, there is plenty of people who would be oppositional to uh, Julian. I think the framing and the way in which he's been um, cast by the most um, powerful people in the world to be either a so-called, you know, sexual harasser and... Uh, you know, skipping bail and uh, all of these, you know, the terrible crimes that he's committed about endangering lives and so on. You know, you've got to realise that Townsville is actually still a military base. There's a very large military contingent here. And so those people tend to think in terms of, oh, if he's against, you know, military action, well, you know, we're against him and probably don't think much more about it. Um, so. There is that. Um, I've got no idea how Townsville would actually vote in a real fair poll, but it's interesting. And even on Magnetic Island, you know, we have little Facebook spats about Julian and whether we can say he's really an islander or was one of us or whatever because he came and he went. And um, I just feel, well, you know, the guy lived here. He, this was the first place he came to as a child. Uh, he obviously loved the place. And I think something of the, the feeling of the island, you know, the sounds of the birds, the, the temperature, the, the freedom to run around with just a pair of shorts just about any time of year, um, the beach, the sense of, yeah, that, that freedom and, and uh, happy-go-luckiness uh, would have impacted, would have would have created uh, an ideal sort of state for a young person to grow up in. Um, in terms of the islanders' attitudes, when, when things really hit the fan for Julian, we've conducted a couple of rallies over the time for Julian in this period. And in 2014, we had what we called a picnic at picnic. So this is Picnic Bay where we live and this is where Julian lived. And we had a picnic on the beach where Julian as a child would have run and played with his mum. And um, we then took a photo. There was, I think, about 70 or 80 people showed up. And for a small island, like for an island of, you know, 2,000 and something people, at pretty short notice, all of these people just came and wanted to be part of it. And we've had several of those little gatherings and rallies and meetings and so on over the years since, and always has been a good response. And so there's certainly a number of people on Magnetic who um, are really have been very supportive and very keen to, to see Julian freed. Um, and, of course, to come back if he... So does ours, and we'd, we'd, you know, be delighted to see him back on the island. Um, there's even been rumours that he has been spotted. I'm not sure if that's true or not. Um, and it, it's not something that I'm chasing up because I think he's entitled to his privacy. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, sort of, it's the sort of thing you would expect to also be hearing at this time. Wait a minute, you, you heard, you're just saying that there are rumours that he was spotted on Magnetic Island since he's returned to Australia? I have heard those rumours, but I don't know if they're true. But that interesting, because I was about to ask you, based on this Murdoch paper, Townsville Bulletin, the headline is, Will Julian Assange return to his North Queensland roots? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's speculation around if WikiLeaks found Assange will head north to his childhood home on Magnetic Island for overdue R&R &R once legalities are completed, or they are completed. That's interesting, if he returned there. And I think this article is kind of alarmist. They don't want him to return. That's, that's what the message is. Be the terms of yeah. yeah. But he's speculating. It's any angle they can find that's local, and uh, we'll we'll slip it into, <laughs> slip the knife in if we can. If we get but what you're saying is, this is my last question, if he did show up there to visit, he would have, get a pretty good welcome, you think? He would, he would, yeah. Um, I, I mean, we, we've had terrific little rallies where, you know, lots of people have showed up and uh, they'd be delighted to see him. 
Um, we've had letter writing groups. Um, in fact, I, I remember a couple of years ago doing a, a sketch of the local hill behind our house, which has got a very prominent rock called Sales Rock. And um, it's something that he would definitely remember. It's quite iconic of this, this bay. And so I did a little sketch because I have a really good view from my backyard of the rock. And um, I thought, well, you know, if you're stuck in Belmar's prison and you're rotting away, maybe a little, a little sketch of the rock might give you some, you know, a little bit of peace or a little bit of happiness and so on to, um, to help the endurance. Um, so, yeah, look, he would definitely be welcome. There'll still be people who say, no, no, he's a this and he's a that and mm. we don't want to know about it. It's like that everywhere. You know, the, the framing of Julian was so successful, it's been very hard to, um, to counteract that in any particular way. So, you know, even the statue thing, I, I'm a little bit in two minds about it myself, only because though I would love to see him recognised, whether a statue is quite the thing, I'm not sure. Uh, certainly something that's got more of a technical aspect to it or even information that's set up around the island might be more, more appropriate to just give people a little bit more of an understanding of who he is and why he became you know, who he was, who he is. I think there were some town councils around Australia that passed resolutions about Joe, if I'm not mistaken. Did, did the council in Townsville ever pass a resolution calling for his release or... Anything like that? Um, not to my knowledge, but we do have a, a rather unusual situation now that we have a new mayor who's become rather infamous in his own right. Um, <clears throat> he was uh, only recently elected earlier this year. Um, the whole of the rest of the council is kind of trying to step aside from him because he made some false, uh, alleged false claims before the election and uh, claimed that he, he'd, worked, he'd been in the uh, SAES in the military, which he wasn't. And uh, there's a whole lot of stuff that I won't go into now, but he has a, a rather powerful um, profile himself. But he's actually called for a statue uh, to, for Julian, which is kind of interesting. I was a bit surprised by that. But again, you know, the... The attitude of a military-type city, which has a large contingent, it's not an easy gig you know, to get up um, a statue for someone like Julian, who is clearly of another um, ill called Gather. And uh, so, you know, I, I think the whole statue thing, it's been bandied around for a long time, and, you know, it would be great to see something, I think, but maybe it would be better to to ask Julian what he's like. I mean, or maybe it's better to have something of a, an image of a little boy running free on the beach, something like that, to express the freedom of this place. It's more appropriate to this mm. place. I don't know. It's, a, it's an interesting uh, discussion point. Yes, indeed. Uh, uh, we'll hear from him hopefully soon. So I'm looking here in 1942, the U.S. had an air command <clears throat> operations and signal building built on in Townsville. There are no U.S military personnel left anymore. It's purely Australian, Royal uh, Australian Air Force. Is that right, the base? Um, in 1942, there were probably over 100,000 US soldiers here. Wow. Um, Townsville became the garrison city for the Battle of the Coral Sea. And General MacArthur, Douglas MacArthur, was, um, Heard of him. was based here. And... Yeah. He had an incredible power. Um, there's amazing stories of this town from those times uh, in all sorts of ways. The, there was huge amounts of discord between Australian soldiers and American soldiers and so on. There was a lot of murders. There was lots of all sorts of things happening here. It was a wild time. But essentially the... Um, the flights that were involved in going out to the Battle of the Coral Sea and a lot of the shipping and so on, uh, it, all of the troops were housed in Townsville before they were taken out, out or brought back and so on. It was a very, very busy place. And um, we even 
We were, we were even bombed by the Japanese once. They hit a coconut tree. <laughs> so um, there was uh, no fatalities, but uh, a little bit of excitement. And, uh, yeah, Townsville has a very interesting history, but certainly the Americans left at the end of World War II. And uh, it, the town was never quite the same after, I don't think. But... Um, it's certainly got that history, and we've still got some forts here on the island, you know, and concrete bunkers and that sort of thing overlooking the bay, and there was some gun emplacements and that sort of thing. Um, so if ever the Japanese were to come into the bay, then they would really be um, they'd be uh, copying the, uh, the shells from the artillery there, and uh, that was, you know, quite a... It's still a tourist attraction here on the island. It's the best place to see koalas. <laughs> on the pillboxes, I think they were called. So yeah. the, is, is that coconut tree uh, marked? Is there a marker where that tree was? Um, I don't think so. Um, so they, somebody uh, drank milk. They, they made milk out of it, right? Once yeah. the bomb hit. I had a, an old friend who actually, as a little boy, rode his bike to that coconut tree and pulled out a shard of the bomb and he had it on his mantelpiece. Wow. So that, that's, you know. So it was an occupied American city, basically. And um, I thought MacArthur was in Melbourne, but I guess for that operation, he moved, moved to towns. I uh, think he was moving around a fair bit. Yeah. He was in Brisbane as well. Right. Uh, at the Townsville headquarters. But all through the north, there were hidden um, barracks and there were airfields south to Charters Towers, which is about an hour and a half uh, southwest of the city. And then up into the Atherton Tablelands, which is nearer to Cairns, north of here. Uh, there's still evidence in the jungles and places. You can still find the old buildings and so on. And uh, there was a lot of military activity in this area um, because it was close to, you know, Guadalcanal and so on. And uh, the Battle of the Coral Sea was the most significant Exchange was the first time the Japanese fleet had been stopped in its tracks, and that was kind of the pivot point for World War II in the Pacific. It was sort of where the Japanese had been stopped and things started to go in the other direction. So it's a really interesting period. So the North Mariana Islands were taken by the U.S. from Japanese occupation, was that? Um, look, I'm, from Townsville? Mm -hmm. I'm not a good enough military historian okay. to answer that one, but... Um, Certainly, the the Battle of the Coral Sea was right based on um, supplies and people coming from Townsville to a large. Of course, the North Mariana Islands is where Julian uh, went to the U.S. federal court to enter his plea. So, is the building where MacArthur uh, uh, stayed is that still standing? His headquarters? Uh, yeah, it's actually called the Sea View Hotel. So, ah, a nice building on the Strand in Townsville. He was mm -hmm. there, and. Uh, the airport, which is still a military-controlled airport, but we have our civilian flights come in there as well. It's still there. And we've got, you know, very uh, lethal Australian um, defence capabilities there. There's, we con not constantly, but we often hear the jets flying over doing exercises. And, you know, it's, it's still very much a garrison town. Well, I want to thank my viewers for allowing me to indulge my interest in history, and I thank you for telling us about that. Kathy, do you have any questions for George? Because I'm through. And I thank you, George, very much for being with us. You're welcome. Okay. Yes, I certainly do. <laughs> George, I just wanted to thank you for giving me some information about life on the island in the 70s, because, in fact, I spent a week on the island when I was in my late teens, maybe early 20s. I can't remember exactly what year it is. One thing that I did do, in fact, two things that I did do, was hire a mini moak. And also we hired two horses for about an hour. The mini moak story, um, well, it makes me think that I have actually met Christine Assange twice in my life. Um, <laughs> if she was still hiring out those mini mokes and we hired that for the whole week and we drove around the island and it was just absolutely fantastic as for the horses that's quite funny because 
maybe they had that Queensland character about them, but they were, they seemed like old horses that just wouldn't move. And when you're young, you know, you want a bit of a gallop. And we rode for about, oh, I don't know, about half an hour uh, because it was only a one hour higher. And as soon as we turned those horses around, <laughs> they galloped <laughs> so fast that I was terrified that they were like, okay, we're happy now. We're on our way home. Now, the third, the third notable memory I have from the island was almost being eaten by a crocodile. And that was on the west coast of the island, which was totally, seemed totally uninhabited. And after doing all of the wonderful things like, um, you know, snorkeling, swimming, bicycle riding, we we hired bicycles as well, the mini moke, the horse riding, um, I decided that I was going to tackle the jungle, what I thought was uh, looked like the jungle to me. And so I, I decided to walk, I think it was 11 kilometers, something like that. It was a, a walk that you could you could do. There was a kind of a pathway um, and it was so hot and like an idiot because I, I wasn't born in Australia. I was born in, the, in Northern Ireland. Oh. I didn't take any water with me. And, uh, you know, I suppose after about four or five kilometers, I, uh, I, I was looking at the plants. There were some what seemed like wild tomatoes and they were kind of bubbling. They were boiling from the heat. And there was a big fence and I could see this beautiful beach on the other side. So I decided to climb over and uh, I went for a swim. And then I lay down on this beautiful sand. And as far as the eye could see in either direction, there was nobody. It was all mine. And then all of a sudden I started getting bitten by these sand flies, like mm -hmm. everywhere. And I thought, this bloody place, it looks like a paradise, but it's not. So then I, I walked back and it wasn't very far, maybe only about 10, 15 metres, climbed over this high fence again. And instead of doing what I'd done on the way over where I stepped gently down, the last, uh, I don't know, about metre or so, I just let go and jumped back onto the ground. And as soon as I hit the ground, a crocodile just leapt up right in my face, I could see down its throat. The whole fence bowed over like towards me and it looked like it was going to break. And I can assure you, Kathy Freeman has never run as fast as what I did at the time. I was very young and I ran about two kilometres without looking back like Lot's wife. Um, <laughs> I thought that would slow me down. And after a couple of kilometres, I stopped running. But I just want to ask you, first of all, if you can still rent the mini mokes, if you can still do the horseback riding, and finally, what the hell has been done about these crocodiles? Because I read not so long ago there was uh, a couple of crocodile sightings up at Horseshoe Bay. Is that the case? Um, I've heard there are stinger nets on the beaches. So on the east side of the island, that's where all, all the accommodation is that's where everyone seems to live and that's where people can safely go swimming but what about on the west side of the island is that still pretty wild and uh, is it safe well um i used to live there um at a place called bulger bay it was the most isolated property on the whole of the island i think it was way back in the bush um, it's a wonderful part of the island. It's it's really quite, it is wild. And um, I'd like to sort of call it Outback Magnetic Island. It's sort of a different feel altogether to the, the seaward side. Um, crocodiles, they do occasionally come to the island, mostly kind of by accident. There's not really enough food for them here to establish themselves. Um, we had a sad case where the rangers had relocated a crocodile from right up on the tip of Cape York and they'd taken it to a, an area south of Magnetic. Um, this is several years ago. And it, there's a funny thing about crocodiles. They, they're terribly homesick. They always want to go back home. 
and they have these remarkable skills for finding their way back home. And uh, and this crocodile was on its way back home, and uh, I happened to get some photos at the time of it being caught by the rangers mm. in a, on the west coast. So and and we'd been looking for it, and it was circling, and it was leaving tracks and so on. And it was quite exciting. Everyone on the island was very excited, but. That's a rarity. It really is a rarity. Uh, and as soon as there's a crocodile sighting, the rangers are just all over it and setting up observation. And, you know, there's people out looking for it and they're setting traps and so on, trying to uh, safely get the reptile and take it somewhere safe. Um, so, yeah, it's possible. Um, and there's quite a lot of mangroves on that side of the island, and there's certainly yeah. plenty of sandflies in the right condition. <laughs> they saved my life. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, I'd, I'd be fascinated if you get up here at some stage to just work out where that was, because if you walked a long way, you might have gotten all the way to West Point, which is about 11 kilometres of, of dirt track. Or you might have just gone around to Cockle Bay, which is not too far at all from here. It's um, it's on the west coast, but it's actually quite a lovely little bay with a house out on the rock and so on. And it mm. might have been there. Yeah, so well, it was about um, – I'd been walking for a couple of hours, so I think it was about halfway. Oh, okay. It didn't take me long to get back down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Look, like generally speaking, the island is a really safe place. Uh, we do have stingers in the wet season, which yeah. are pretty uh, are pretty scary, um, but they have the nets and it's it's basically just smart to put on a what they call a stinger suit, which will protect people from stingers and, and sunburn too. They're pretty good for not getting too burnt, so it's quite good. So it just seemed uh, to me to be like a, a paradise at the time. I mean, as a young person, uh, I was very fit, and uh, there's just so much for young people to do. Is it fun for older people as well? What can you do on the island if you go there just to visit? Look, these days there's plenty to do on the island. Mostly it's um, it's just taking in nature. It's uh, swimming on the beaches, um, Lovely beaches, very, very pretty. Snorkeling, diving, fishing, um, and bushwalking. Um, and there's some terrific trails. And of course, there's it's the most northerly colony of koalas on uh, in Australia. There's a couple more a bit further north, but they're not to anywhere near the number we have here. So it's quite a. I mean, it's a bustling tourist island. There's a lot of people come here. Because it's very accessible, it's, a, it's you know part of the World Heritage Great Barrier Reef, but you can get here very easily and it's still in pretty good nick. Yeah, because Townsville's a pretty big airport. That's where I landed when I came up uh, last time. And incidentally, Joe mentioned that I had made a little film with a lady called Alison Mason who had initiated a petition to get this sculpture made of Julian Assange. And I think in the later stages of it, there was some talk about it being him as a little boy. She did mention as well that the new mayor was very keen on it. So is that project still alive or has it been totally killed by the Townsville Bulletin? <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, it's something that gets banded around. I don't think much will happen because there's so much um, conflict within the council itself at the moment. The mayor has been all sort of elected unexpectedly um, and all of the former councillors and the new councillors don't want to know about him. They think he's he deceived the voters to be elected. He didn't tell the truth. Um, and this is, you know, they're, best, they're barely talking to each other. It's kind of um, <sighs> not a good situation for, you know, local government to operate under. So I don't think anything's going to be happening soon. I think to do that kind of thing, probably a community organisation maybe should pick it up and just try and do it themselves and then get the permissions as as they are required. But 
look, it's not something that's, you know, going to happen soon. What about on the island? I mean, that's where he was as a little boy. Yeah. Could that happen there on the island? Would it be more independent? I think the island would be the place for it. Um, it's much more appropriate for the island to have it. Yeah. Um, and certainly there would be support for it. But the island is, is still part of Townsville. It's just a suburb in terms of the local government. It has a, its own population and they might be very keen, but they don't run the show. The, the island doesn't have an independent sort of local government or organisation. It has some various uh, bodies that talk on behalf of locals and so on, but it doesn't. It's represented by a, a city councillor who comes and, you know, hears grievances and so on. But like the rest of the city, they have their councillors too. And so the island is is more like, a, in, in official terms, it's a, it's a suburb of Townsville. That's, that's right. it. Yeah. Oh, finally, I'd just like to recommend to our viewers that they watch a documentary that you made not so long ago. I um, hope I pronounce this correctly, but it's the Anne Kearney story, which is is about life. It's about her, of course, this extraordinary woman and her journey. And she became quite a public figure, really, who was giving so much help to communities. But uh, you have made this documentary. It's by George Hurst. And it told me there's so much archival footage in it. And you taught me so much about life on the island, not only in those very early days when Julian was born and not long after when I went there for a week and saw what it was like there, but also in the 90s and going forward into the early noughties. Would you like to say something about your documentary? <laughs> sure, I would. Um, we made that film because our friend Anne Carney, uh, she had cancer and she was dying. And we used to go around and visit her. And every time we did, she'd tell us another story. And we just go, oh, that's fantastic, you know. And in the end, we just thought, we've got to put a camera on her and just get what we can. And so it was very much a, something one does with a friend. And then it just snowballed and snowballed and snowballed. And so we had the most amazing international connections that she had coming in and wanting to be part of it. And uh, so. We turned it into basically a feature documentary, um, which is on our website. People can watch it for free. It's uh, at crankycurlew.com.au. You can find it very easily there. And the, the film is called In and Out of Control, The Ann Carney Story. She was a wild girl and she was an alcoholic and she was bipolar. And uh, it's not a, not a good mix, those two, but she did manage to do a great deal with her life and uh, stop drinking and get things under control. But she was always a stirrer. And really, quite frankly, in the Julian tradition, she was a straight-talking, you know, no-nonsense person who wouldn't take it from anybody. Um, you know, she would pick fights with bikies in pubs. <laughs> she didn't mind. <laughs> um, so... Look, you know, it's actually a good story, in, I think, in that we managed to bring in the history of a changing town, in particularly in the 1970s, um, and that thing I was saying before about, you know, it used to be a rough old tough town of army abattoir and railway workers, and then a university arrived. And what happens when those cultures start to kind of clash or connect or whatever? Um, and, you know, even like doing the research, I spent a lot of time just trying to find one photo of the first International Women's Day march in Townsville. And I, I finally found it through a connection in Uruguay. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's quite, a, quite a document, I think. I mean, we made it because of our friend and we showed it on the island as a kind of community filmmaking, but... A lot of people have seen it outside of our community and have just loved the film because she's funny and there's some funny stories in it. They're, they're just genuinely funny for any audience. And yeah, well, I, I absolutely loved it. Um, I was glued, 
right till the end. And I've also appreciated some of your other films, which where you are really concerned about the world heritage aspect of Magnetic Island and the environment. Uh, these films that you've made are absolutely beautiful as well. You have a Vimeo channel too, don't you? Cranky Curl You. It's probably best just to go to our website, which is Cranky Curlew, C-R-A-N-K-Y-C-U-R-L-E-W. The curlews are the bird of magnetic island, like the national bird of magnetic island. They're quite mad um, and have ridiculously skinny legs. So crankycurlew.com.au. Most of our films are there free to watch. So you're very welcome to encourage people to just have a look because you get a sense of what magnetic islands like and uh, it's yes. uh, it's a very interesting place it's not just a holiday getaway no. obviously I saw a lot of curlews when I was up in Townsville staying <laughs> about an hour north of Townsville and they were just wandering around they looked like they were they couldn't see very well. They looked like they were completely lost. They were all over the place. And they had the weirdest call. The bird song of the curlew is really haunting, it's isn't really, it? It's quite bizarre. And they just go off in the night. And if yeah. you don't know what it is, you might think that babies are being murdered or something. Yes, that's what it sounds <laughs> like. It's just a curlew. It's just a cranky old curlew. <laughs> George, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you today. And we have learned so much about Magnetic Island, the place where Julian Assange spent his early childhood, but also where so many other significant things happened. And I'm sure... A lot of people are going to put it on their list of destinations of places they must see. Well, thanks very much, Cathy and Joe. It was lovely to talk to you. And uh, I really hope your poor old sinuses pick up a little bit, Joe. It looks like you've been suffering pretty badly. A long, a long time, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you.